Bonsoir à tous et bienvenue pour cette table ronde de clôture de notre journée des rencontres du développement durable co-organisée par l'Institut Open Diplomacy avec l'EDEC consacré aujourd'hui à la finance responsable, investir à la finance responsable. Ça a été le thème de toute cette journée. On a interrogé les grands principes de rationalité économique qui ne semblent pas tout à fait alignés avec nos rationalités climatiques. On a interrogé l'intérêt des générations futures. On a interrogé nos capacités à flécher effectivement les investissements dans la bonne direction, on vient de parler des notions d'interdépendance entre le Nord et le Sud et les écarts, euh, les resources mismatch, la façon dont l'allocation des ressources est euh, in, inefficace par rapport aux défis climatiques. On va évidemment rassembler toutes ces idées, toutes ces informations euh, dans ce panel de clôture dans un moment un peu particulier puisque euh, les rencontres du développement durable sont organisées en parallèle de la conférence sur l'avenir de l'Europe exercice mené par la Commission européenne, le Parlement européen et le Conseil de l'Union européenne pour pouvoir donner à chacune et chacun d'entre vous le pouvoir de contribuer à la, au futur de l'Union européenne. Et comme ce sujet euh, est un sujet profondément européen qui se joue beaucoup à Bruxelles, je vous invite tous à profiter de ce moment de démocratie participative à l'échelle continentale pour utiliser ces débats et contribuer directement à la conférence sur l'avenir de l'Europe. Um, I'll switch now into English to make sure that our panel goes smoothly as we welcome into this concluding uh, conference um, speakers from all across the world that would have loved to, to have Rodol Dr. Rodolfo Lassi, former Minister for the Environment from Mexico, being with us as the Director for the Environment at the OECD, but unfortunately he had to drop last minute, but we have the chance to welcome in the panel Dr. Isabella Texera, co-chair of the International Resource <coughs> Panel at UN uh, Environment Programme and former Minister of Brazil for the Environment. Uh, welcome, Isabella. I hope you do hear us correctly. Yes, yes. thank you very much for inviting me to join today. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I also welcome in the discussion Dr. Musonda Mumba, Director of the Rome Center for Sustainable Development at the UNDP, the UN uh, Development Programme. Hello, uh, Musonda, do you hear her correctly? Yeah, I trust you are with us in the panel. And I also welcome um, the former Chief Financial Officer uh, from the World Bank, uh, Bertrand Badré, also founder and managing partner of the fund Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital. Hello, Bertrand. Hello, hello from um, Doha. <laughs> from all across the, the globe, from Brazil to Doha, uh, uh, going through Rome, uh, we are connected to, together. And today on stage with me, I'm happy to host also Frédéric Samama, Director for the Responsible Investment at Amundi, what, one of the greatest uh, um, uh, investment uh, asset manager on earth. Hello, Frédéric, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Too. Well, the panel is... is um, despite the, 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 the fact that uh, Rodolfo had to drop, uh, is very rich and we will have, I'm sure, many avenues to explore and in order to conclude this day on, financial and on responsible finance. What I would like to start with is the fact that we all have the information we need to understand that beyond plus two degrees, uh, the world is absolutely unpredictable. That has been established clearly by the IPCC. And certainty is, uh, despite that, probably the most difficult thing to compute in economic policy and investment decisions. So I'm wondering why we do get to such a dead end. When our institutions are based on rationality, we keep irrationally losing time ahead of the climate crisis. And that's why I'm I'd like to turn to former Minister Texera, uh, Isabella, uh, we are one year ahead of celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Rio summit, uh, which gave birth to the three Rio conventions. So we could not say there, is, there has been awareness rising for only a few years. It has been actually almost three decades and more. So how came we get into that dead end? So oh, now this is a, a $1 billion question, I think, so, but... Uh, I think that uh, it's very important to understand two different momentum uh, of the climate uh, challenges, the climate governance, the global climate governance. Last century, 
I think that the the world, the world came exactly to address uh, a solution of legal framework to address climate crisis. And this was what we achieved, the UNFCCC Rio plus Rio 92 conference and, uh, and also Kyoto Protocol in 997. And you have the developed countries, developed countries committed uh, to address climate targets and unfortunately, the developed countries failed uh, to address the rules of the game and also disembarked from KP. Uh, this is very important to highlight because you have this new century today and the uh, climate is still there uh, in worst scenarios, as you know, as you mentioned. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and we need to have all on board, not only developed economies, but also developing in key uh, emerging economies to address a uh, really robust ambition to tackle climate change. And this means that to have a new geopolitical, uh, climate geopolitical contest, and it's very important to observe this, and that you have Paris Agreement as a new reference. Uh, uh, we're able in the past uh, to achieve Paris Agreement uh, to go against the climate negationism, and now it's very important that we must leave behind the climate fatalism uh, that meaning that's impact many the young people today uh, in Glasgow and Glasgow it's a conference uh, to put in practice Paris Agreement not to replace Paris Agreement. It's very important to observe that we need uh, to have the domain of the economic and social picture the field of climate change if you want to move on. And uh, my feeling that uh, in climate emergency if you are not on the side of the solutions, you are on the side of the problem. And, uh, and uh, I think that we have really huge tasks. In 2010, science said that we have around 30 years to cut 50% of the emissions. Now, we have less than 10 years to cut this. So this is really a huge task. And my feeling is that you need to move forward based on the progressiveness of the NDCs, Article 4 of, uh, 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 of Paris Agreement, but uh, considering uh, uh, that it's very important to understand uh, that we have this transition after pandemics, that we have the effects of pandemics in, in uh, 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 climate strategy, we need to look for how we can have uh, urgent climate governance arrangements, except to make consensus and convergences of these common interests and to avoid what you used to say, the leakage of, uh, of, the, of the national interest based on the old uh, or no, no green economies or no carbon economies versus the, uh, the urgency of the presence that demands uh, climate solutions now. So my feeling is that uh, it, this scenario is worse than the past because in the past, suppose that you have time, you don't have much time to manage this. And you have to do this based on a, realist, a pragmatic realism, considering not only the public uh, arrangements, the public states, the government arrangements, but also uh, what we want, what we need from private sector and how it would be very important to address a robust governance system, climate systems, to make sure how private sector should play and what are the rules, what are the transparency that you need, what is the transparency that you need from this, and also how you can consider short-term perspectives, as you mentioned, by 2025 and 2030, and the vision of, for the future, or the vision of the future, net zero by 2050, a concept, the vision that everyone's supposed to agree, but it's not clear yet, but nobody, no one knows the pathways that must be adopted. So my feeling is that to have really different things at the same time, uh, with different delusions of the present, I used to say, but in my perspective, it's very important to conclude the negotiations in COP26 and make clear that we need a robust, innovative climate government, global climate governance system to make sure how these different players will come together and how step by step we are going to face uh, uh, the, the ambition, to, 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 to raise ambition. And the other side, we need to address you, uh, the poorest country, sorry, and uh, the vulnerable ones. Only to make sure that uh, one thing, uh, if you allow me, 
it's not only north and south, okay? We need to understand the role of the green global south, west, and eastern. It's very that's, important to observe when we discuss climate governance now. That's Thank you. exactly what I wanted to actually go forward with. Uh, thank you so much, Isabella, for this very complete answer. And I was actually about to turn to Musonda Mumba, um, Director for the Rome Center of on Sustainable Development at UNDP, precisely to see how you don't put aside uh, north and south, but how you uh, articulate uh, efforts in the global north and in the global south, because uh, we have been talking about this since at least Copenhagen summit on the way to operate um, support to the global south in achieving uh, this transition as they do represent, those countries do represent most uh, important parts of uh, carbon emissions today, uh, or at least they face the most demanding effort to achieve carbon neutrality. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how you understand or how you envision the, how you capture the awareness of the danger in the South. I'm asking that question speci specifically because we all know, even in the North, that any emergency to ensure food security, to ensure uh, security at all, or to, uh, to face a pandemic can blow us away from the main goal that is achieving climate uh, carbon neutrality. So. In, in, the, in the Global South, there are many reasons to get away, to be distracted from that goal, ending poverty, which is key, the first SDG, many other issues. How do you assess their readiness to be up to the challenge of the COP26 that happens in the very few weeks? Well, thank you so very much for having me. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. It's perfect. Brilliant. So, I mean, what, what's very interesting, it's just that I'm having an echo, actually. I don't know if I should remove my headphones. Um, it, it sounds like on our side, it's okay. Maybe there is something wrong on your side. But we wait for you, Musonda. Don't, do, don't bother. Uh, without the mic, uh, we don't hear you now. We, we face some uh, mic issue here. Um, I'm sorry about that, uh, Fox. Um, we, try to, we try to connect you differently, Musonda, as we want to tackle this very important issue about the aw awareness that puts us ready to, to achieve the COP26 objectives. The team here is gonna try to reconnect you because taking action is indeed very urgent, as uh, Isabella has pointed out. And we need to flow the cash towards a greener economy, towards effective um, objectives. Many pledges have happened over the past few weeks uh, on Earth to commit to achieve carbon neutrality. We've seen numbers dropped by many CEOs uh, from public or private institutions. Ahead of COP26 in Glasgow, it still sounds we don't get to meet the target. And that's why I'm wondering on the role that finance can play to accelerate the transition without dropping numbers, but in the objective of getting indeed effective um, um, carbon uh, uh, investments that meet uh, neutrality objectives. Bertrand, you've written a book that is entitled Can Finance Save the World? What's the answer behind the book in that, in that realm? Well, I'm sure if we ask uh, all the people which are listening, the answer is probably 99% would say no finance can save the world. If at least it could stop ruining the world, that would be a progress. So my title was a little provocative, as you can imagine. Uh, I, I think the jury is still largely out. I think public finance has moved, but is not there yet, as has been said uh, before me. And we know we, we still need to mobilize way more. And, and it's true that all the analysis of the recovery plan post-COVID shows that there is an element of greenness, uh, but still not to the point where we're expecting it. Uh, so on the, this is on the public side. On, on the private side, I think the jury is also out. Uh, there is a lot of talk. There is a lot of commitments. There are things happening, so I don't want to deny that. But the truth is that uh, it's still not totally clear whether this is serious, how far it will go, etc. 
a lot of this is, is uh, intentional and, and declarative and uh, it's a lot of commitments where people are getting lost because they don't really know who is pledging what when etc uh, there has been there have been two interesting reports which were released in the past few weeks uh, one from the bis uh, and frederick is very familiar with that institution saying that there is a a, 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 a green bubble actually uh, and, and this is not a surprise because a lot of people now have pledged to do more green and they are not that they are not enough green assets so obviously uh, people are rushing uh, to uh, value uh, whatever is green and, and give a value which is probably not sustainable without playing with the words. So on the one hand, there, is a, there are elements of a green bubble. On the other hand, the EDEC, the French business school, uh, released a report where they, they screen uh, the products that were labeled uh, green by, by the various uh, indices, producers, etc. And the answer was unequivocal. Uh, these products are, are not really green, not really sustainable, etc. And it's not even ambiguous. It's, it's, very, uh, it's very far away from the stated objective. So I think Glasgow will be the moment of truth and should be the moment of truth. Will finance be up to the expectations or will it deceive again? I, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm, I was asked very recently by a journalist on TV whether uh, the investigation by the SEC of uh, potential greenwashing by DWS was the diesel gate of green finance. Uh, I have no idea whether it's true or not, it's being investigated, but the very fact that a journalist starts to question whether we have a diesel gate uh, risk uh, showed that uh, the jury is out and that it's really up to us collectively to demonstrate that there is a true willingness, that there is a true commitment uh, to show that finance uh, can save the world and not produce another uh, uh, area of fog around all these issues. Thank you so much, uh, Bertrand. It's indeed very important to highlight the fact that we don't need another bullshit storm. We need clarity on what is at stake. Um, well, I, I, I would like to, to, to go through uh, this uh, idea in getting to uh, Frédéric uh, Samama, who is indeed very connected to that to that reflection, but as we have brilliantly brought back Musonda to the to the um, to the debate, I'd like to connect back to her and and uh, get a, get back to the question I was raising: How do you assess the readiness and uh, uh, awareness of the global south on the different um, challenges ahead of COP26? We don't hear you, Musonda. Do do you? Are we with us? Well, we don't hear the sound here. Uh, it sounds like we we don't we don't get you in, into the debate. It's a, it's a shame on our side. Well, let, let's keep running with uh, with this um, um, important point that Bertrand has made. There is there is um, this green bubble getting at the at the horizon. And, and the, the, the provocative title that Bertrand chose, uh, chose for his book, Can't Find and Save the World, is, is key here. Frédéric, how, if, if finance can save the world, I would put it that way, how will it save the world? Is it by auto-regulation, by different standard setting, by pledges? How do you assess this, uh, this um, ability of the financial industry to meet the challenge we face? Uh, first, uh, I agree with Bertrand. Uh, he was my former boss, so I naturally uh, <laughs> agree with him. Um, uh, more seriously, uh, I think that uh, first, um, policymakers must do the job. Finance can come, but only second. The ones that must put pressure on corporates are the policymakers. Second, um, finance can play a, a pivotal role, I think, at two levels. The first one is to frame the debate correctly. And second, to come with concrete, pragmatic, scalable, transparent solutions. So let's elaborate on that. Your very first question was why it took so much time to take action and so on. One of the reasons was that we had a lot of difficulties to frame the debate in the right way. And actually, that's why with the BIS, Banque de France, Columbia University, and myself, we released a book um, two years ago, The Green Swan. We said, what is climate change? 
is that a risk like the others? It seems so because people are using the usual models to analyze climate change, but are we right with that? And we said, maybe not. Because we said climate change is a very special risk for three reasons. The first one is it's a risk that is certain. The question is only how big and when, but the risk is there. The second reason is that you have a lot of non-linearities interacting with each other. Physical risks, societal risks, and so on and so on. And when you have such a situation, it's almost impossible to establish a model. And when you cannot establish a model, that means that you must take action before trying to understand the consequences of the problem. And that's a totally new way of thinking. And the third reason why climate change is different from the other risks is that it threatens human lives. And actually, we released a book in January 2020. We had no idea about the virus 19. But the virus 19 is a concrete example of a green swan. It was certain, only um, Bill Gates knew about it, but it was certain. A lot of non-linearities, a Chinese virus triggers an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Russia on the oil price. And suddenly, to save lives, governments have agreed to stop the economies around the planet. So it means that here we are facing a totally different situation. So the old models, the old ways of governing are not just adapted to that situation. So the very first responsibility that we all have collectively is to frame the debate in the right way. The second responsibility that we have, not to be too long, is to put some concrete solutions on the table. Um, you, talked, you said about the commitments of the COP26 and so on. We are seeing a tsunami here about commitments on being net zero. Uh, $6.6 .6 trillion from asset owners, $43 trillion from asset managers, overall $80 trillion. And recently, with Professor Bolton and Kasper Sik from Imperial College, we released a paper on what does it mean. And here we went back to science. To be carbon neutral, says IPCC, is having a carbon budget of 300 gigaton of CO2. 300 gigaton. And what we say is that what is true for the planet should be true for all investments, meaning that we should reduce gradually the carbon footprint of, of the portfolios by 10% year after year up to 2050. It's very simple, it's very pragmatic, and it's scalable. And really, I think we have that responsibility not to dream about complicated solutions, to create sometimes false problems, where the scope three and so on and so on, but to come with something that we can, we can, act, we can put in place on a large scale. So here we have two major mm -hmm. responsibilities. It's indeed very important. Um, thank you so much, uh, Frédéric, for, for this complete answer. Um, uh, to, to keep running the debate accordingly, I need to know whether we have made it to get Musonda back into the, the panel. And I'm again very sorry about this situation. Uh, they, told, they tell me that uh, we, we are trying to... Okay, Tom, Tom can, can, can you hear yes. me? Hello. <laughs> well, Musonda, so, so glad to hear you and to have you in the panel. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, so, Frédéric just yes. made a, a very strong point on the very specific risk that climate risk is and means as it's non-linear and as a threat on human uh, lives. That's obviously something you're working on at UNDP too. But Correct. So I'll ask you a double question and you will have double uh, slice of time to answer. First, uh, to, to assess the way that the Global South envisions the problem. And, and the second question to keep going with, what, uh, with the point of Frédéric mm -hmm. is the way that UNDP is working precisely on, this, uh, on, IB, on our ability to uh, face this non-linear risk that uh, climate risk means as the UNDP is indeed coordinating the policy decisions at the G20 level when it turns to green finance. I I'm curious on the way you help both public and private financial institutions to follow the wise advisors that uh, Frédéric has just outlined. So you have two questions and because of our connection you have two uh, slices of time. 
Right. No, thank you so very much. I think what's really interesting is that when you get to, to speak last and hear the conversation, you, you get an opportunity to, to kind of tie, tie that conversation together. I think I want to pick up a little bit on Isabel's point. Firstly, you know, um, this pandemic has been a shocker for everybody, for the entire globe. And if there's anything that has brought commonality and has really uh, brought us together as humanity is this one thing, the virus. Um, and let's go back to 1972. Um, when Danella Meadows and, and the team and, and the team that was part of the Limits to Growth predicted that our very um, sustainable consumption would have implications. That was an economic model that was done in 1972. 50 years on, here we are really in a crisis. And I think picking up on both Betra and, and also Frederic, it's really very telling in terms of what our economic systems um, have also manifested around, you know, how we, we deal with our economies, etc. I've just come back from Milan this weekend where the pre-COP was happening. And it was interesting and great to see a lot of young people who were not born 50 years ago and really challenge even, you know, the older generation around, you know, the green washing, around the women washing, around the finance washing, um, but also calling out, you know, our fractured relationship with nature. So us as UNDP and particularly um, the Rome Center, we've been very much um, instrumental in, in working very closely with the G20. And, and what's interesting within this process, I think it's been very enlightening for me to also begin to understand how we look at sustainable finance going forward. But I think more importantly, what is even becoming more clearer um, as we, you know, on this road to COP26 is very much how do we have these nature positive economies? What does that actually really mean in reality? And your question around this connection to the global south and the global north, I think what the, the, the climate change crisis um, has done and what this pandemic has done is really to sort of demonstrate our inability on our levels of preparedness. How prepared are we for crises? But at the same time, I think this pandemic has shown how even, you know, our economies, our social fabric, um, and our environmental structures, really the domino effect just came crumbling um, during this lockdown and a real demonstration that we cannot afford not to collaborate. That SDG 17, how do we collaborate why do we collaborate? The competitive nature of us versus them is no longer a thing that we can afford to even have on the table. So I think at COP26, it begs then the question, we've been saying time for action, time for action since we last all met in person in Madrid in COP25. Now is the moment where that action is really called to the table and we do things differently. And I was really happy to hear about Betra's book and just see how, you know, a lot of work that has been done, be it from the World Bank or from sort of other um, multilateral public and, and uh, entities is beginning to demonstrate that we need a rethink ar around our model. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what will happen in, in Glasgow, a very challenging time for us collectively. Um, but I think um, as, as the, uh, you know, the champions for um, the high level champions for climate, both uh, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz are really calling to the race to zero, race to resilience, even asking more fundamental questions. What do our economies look like resilient? What do our social fabric look like resilient? How, what does this personal resilience even look like going forward? And how do we, you know, really begin to respond to a crisis that has really brought to the fore our very fractured uh, relationship with nature. So at UNDP in all the countries we work on, this is really amplified to a whole different level in terms of the green recovery, the green recovery. And this is something that our administrator Akim Steiner has been really tooting about and blowing the horn. We have to really rethink and look at how we advance this green recovery going forward and how we build forward better. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Musunda. What is interesting in your point is that uh, you, you, you put a spot on, this, on the fact that we are on, on the verge of a rethinking of our system and you, you actually express the kind of words we need to, to figure out what the thi rethinking means in saying we need a nature positive approach, which means completely different thing from a race to zero. And I, I'd like to turn to Bertrand to, to discuss a bit this uh, tipping points from one paradigm to the other. 
uh, as indeed we've witnessed the UN Secretary General mobilizing, mobilizing all energies of the UN systems to race to zero, to get to carbon reduction as much as possible and to keep compensating the carbon uh, not reduced. But it sounds like it doesn't, it, it doesn't match the target that needs us to regenerate our uh, nature as we have devastated it so much. Do you think in that, when you said there, there is a 99% um, uh, probability of answer that finance can't save the world, if we believe the 1% left, do you believe that we can get beyond net zero to a nature positive approach or do you think that the system is not ready for such a rethinking? Uh, again, I, I come back to my point. I, I believe we are at a moment where uh, uh, I'm forcing myself to see the glass half full, where in reality I believe the glass is half empty. Uh, but we need to keep it half full to, to keep mobilizing people, etc. I think we have no choice. It's been said by all the other speakers. We are at a moment where there is, there is no way back. We have not reached the point of non-return. We're still on our way uh, to the objectives we agreed to uh, six years ago. But it's a, it's a long way. What is uh, what, what what actually I think is a real mistake, and I was part of that mistake actually, and and, uh, uh, and I would not uh, I, I, I would not celebrate too early the role of the multilateral international organization. I think they they are also they are part of the uh, they are also part of the problem, if I may say. But maybe it's another discussion. Uh, in, in 2015, when we agreed on both the SDG and the uh, Paris Agreement on Climate, not to forget actually the discussion in Addis on, on the Partnership for Development. I think the, the mood there was that we would go there naturally, that it was the right thing to do, uh, and that basically the invisible end will play its role, and that the market will follow, and, 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 and great people led by people like Frederick and others would really move the needle naturally, and that it would come. So we had this macro uh, calculation of the trillions that were needed to get there, the, the effort that we needed to, to, to reduce our footprint, etc. All this was kind of modeled, but there was no real conversation on how to get there. Was our system uh, equipped uh, to get there or not? And uh, honestly, I, I was hesitant at that time. I, I, I released this report called From Billions to Trillions, which was really uh, questioning how do we move from a few billions of public money to trillions of private money moving in the right direction. Uh, but we didn't spend that much time on, on the intrinsic default of our system. And now with the COVID, they are more and more visible. Basically, after the, the financial crisis 10 years ago, we did not really work on the, the, the system itself. We, we, we kind of uh, patched up the system, we've increased the ratios, blah, blah, blah. I was part of that and it was probably the right thing to do, but we did not really discuss the design of the system. And now we are struggling with a, with a price of carbon and tomorrow we'll be struggling with the price of biodiversity, of nature, uh, of social life, etc. So our system does not naturally incorporate all of this. And so we have to force the system and it's never good and easy to force a system. Uh, so on the one hand, we are very happy that few pioneers are moving in the right direction. We are celebrating them. We are hiding ourselves behind all these guys. On the other hand, we, we, we now realize that uh, to go to, to, to what we agreed to in 2015, it's a real change. It's going to be a painful change. It's, it's going to be an investment. Uh, and uh, as every investment, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's an effort today that we have to make. Uh, and some people will be winners, some people will be losers, etc. And it's kind of uh, eye-opening the situation we see today. And I think it's, uh, as I said, Glasgow will be the moment of truth. I mean, are we serious about all of this or not? And uh, in fairness, I hope we are. In reality, uh, I'm afraid we are not. That's that's the que the question I need to answer uh, to, to 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 highlight. Uh, a moment in truth is a moment when you reveal leaders and those who don't lead the way truly. Essentially, when you said that there is a need to change to redesign the system, as we've not achieved that uh, along the past financial crisis. Um, mostly ensuring financial stability, but not capturing all the rest of the risks. Um, that calls upon leadership. And, and I wanted to turn back to, to uh, Isabella Teixeira, who I remind was um, environment minister uh, in Brazil and is now the co-chair of the International Resource Panel at the UN Environment Programme. You truly are one of those leaders who keep advocating for this and to keep it to uh, the last kilometer, to delivery. 
if we look at the G20, for example, who was meant to be the group of leaders able to change the system, to redesign it, um, we don't see many environmental discussions at the G20. There are where only twice minister, minister meetings for the environment, once in 2019 in Japan, once uh, in Italy this year, um, uh, in, in Napoli in, in July. Well, where is leadership if it's not at the G20 table? Well, they tell me uh, when I was asking my question that Isabella was off, so my question is dead, and I'm sorry about that. It's uh, it's not a match. Um, Bertrand, you, you just pointed it out, and I'm sure um, uh, you said it yourself. Frédéric is one of those leaders who try to make it from the industry. Frédéric, I'd like to, to, to ask you the same question, but with a different perspective, because you're not obviously one of the G20 finance ministers. Mm -hmm. So I would not put it on your shoulders, but still, uh, leading the industry towards the right direction is key. I'd like to know how difficult it is to make that move. Um, it's difficult because we, again, we need to, to frame the debates, I think, in the proper way. To, to follow up on what Bertrand said, what was a very basic approach? Let's have a price on carbon, on biodiversity, and suddenly everything will be solved. Actually, yes, we need a price, but we need to, to reflect on that as well. If you read the, the, the recent book of Mark Carney, who knows something about climate change, he says, are we so sure that we need a price on carbon, on biodiversity? And he refers to um, a philosopher, an American philosopher, Michael Sandor, who um, gives a very concrete example of a daycare in Israel. In Israel, parents were late, like always in all daycares around the planet. And so it was not good. I mean, we see the point and so on and so on. And so someone had a bright idea. He said, oh, we should put a price on being late. There is a negative externality. We give penalty. It will adjust. And actually, it's exactly the other way around. People were even more late. And when they cut the penalty in order to reduce the fact that parents were late, it stayed at above. So it means something very important is that when you put a price on something, it changes the relationship that we have with that. And so biodiversity, it's just about our survival. What is the price for that? That's the first point. The second point is that um, we have a problem. We have too much carbon in the atmosphere. Where is the green R&D? There was a report released a few years ago from uh, Nick Stern who said we, we, we invest a fraction of the subsidies that we are giving to polluting companies. It's absurd. If you read the IEA report, they say, you know, less than 50% of the technology that are needed to, to achieve the net zero are, are almost um, just an, in the R&D process. So we, we had this tax approach instead of investing with all the difficulties. And third, as, as Bertrand said, we are entering a chaotic world. Where are the institutions to help countries to, um, um, with a kind of uh, solidarity? We invented in 1944-45 the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, and so on. At that time, climate change was not a topic, but now it is. We, we tend to forget, but in Syria, the war started with uh, droughts, and people had to leave the countryside. They went to the city, there was a war, and now refugees and so on. Nobody helped Syria at that time for, for the drought. That's, uh, that's very important to, because it, connects the, it connected us with the leadership question I was asking. We lack institutions that help us in getting into the right direction, because there is a global governance issue here. And maybe I'd like to maybe zoom a bit before getting back to you, Frédéric, on, on this global governance issue that we, we, we have in asking Musonda whether she can help us in envisioning this global governance issue. What I'd like to understand from you, Musonda, as you both lead the Rome Center for Sustainable Development at the um, UNDP and, and then ensure the Secretariat of some working groups of the G20, how do you assess the fragmentation of uh, multilateralism system 
uh, and how do you assess the, 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 the difficulty to build consensus on what is to be done and not to be said about what we are discussing today. I'm taking one example. In the previous panel, Gabriela Ramos just said, we have been agreeing at the G20 nations since the Pittsburgh summit on the need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. That was part of all G20 communiques since 29. Why is it not then delivered? What, what, what accountability can we count on to make sure we get to the end of the journey? So I'm asking you from, from the internal um, system as an insider, how do you assess this fragility uh, we all put the finger on? No, thank you so much. I just want to pick up a little bit on what Frederick said, that we are entering a chaotic world. We are in a chaotic world. Um, and I think this is where the, the, the reality kind of, you know, the check-in moment kind of comes in. And I also want to pick up a bit on the point uh, from Bertrand saying that, you know, Glasgow will be a moment of truth. So not so long ago, you know, the IAE, um, you know, the body that even looks at the issue of around energy for the first time uh, late last year, you know, produced a report that actually talked about keeping um, fossil fuels in the ground. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm actually amazed that for the first time this was said. So back to your question on the G20. And I think this is where the bigger question around, you know, the, the rethinking of our systems. And I, and I, and I come to, to Bertrand's point where he says it's the how, you know, when we were in 2015, very excited, oh my God, the G, you know, the, the post 2030, the agenda 2030, we're going in the right direction. We did not redefine the how. And I think the moment of redefining that how has happened now as we navigate this pandemic, as we've reached a point where even the EU, which is a G20 um, member, we're beginning to rethink this green recovery. What does that look like? Now let's speak, you know, position a mirror to the African continent. And this is also a moment where we begin to think about this relationship um, across the, you know, across the, the waters, as it were, where we have to remember that you know these two continents we're all now more connected than ever and have to sit at that table as equal partner to discuss how we navigate this multilateralism i want to pick up on the technology issue i think africa on one hand has an opportunity in this moment of green recovery and the au has produced this green recovery agenda which is being discussed and i think has been a part of discussion together with the eu um, to begin to rethink um, the technology element. How do we rethink just technologies? Technologies that are also gender responsive and gender sensitive as well, because um, what we do know now is that the system thinking lens is needed much more now than it's ever been needed before. But also our system's leadership is needed now than it's never been needed before. So back to your response around, you know, the sustainable finance discussion and how the G20 is discussing on elements of subsidies. I think um, we will see um, at the end of the Italian presidency, um, end of October, to see how before they hand over the baton to Indonesia, what is it that they like to commit? And what is amazing is I think this is the first time in, in, in the history that we have the UK as a G7 member, a G7 president, Italy G20 uh, president and both co-presidency of a COP, of a climate COP. So how do we have a common thread that cuts across all these three multilateral processes? And I think indeed COP26 will be the moment of reckoning going forward. And thank you so much Musanda for uh, putting together indeed the political work that has been achieved by Italy and UK as cooperating to lead both the G20 and the G7 into the right direction as they co-chair the COP26. We have had good news uh, from the US getting, getting back into the Paris Agreement and, and putting millions uh, on the table to, to achieve carbon neutrality. We had good news from China also uh, to make more precise the commitments to achieve carbon neutrality both at home and abroad, but still if we look at the G20 family picture, we don't see many leaders involved in uh, delivering those objectives. And I'm turning to Isabella, who probably has a, a, f a more free uh, uh, word on this. How do you assess 
the G20 and G7A ability to deliver on this promise. We have brought you back into the debate uh, on the phone as we lost you, Isabella, earlier on, but welcome back. Oh, I, I'm not sure if I can hear you very well, but I hope that you can hear me. It's, okay. it's all right. Thank you so I much. Have, okay, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I don't know what happened, but I do my best trying to answer this question. I think that, and I cannot hear the other answers from my panel, from my friends from the panel, I'm sorry. But I think that uh, it's very important to observe two or three things when you go into the G20. The first one is that we must allow synergies of the climate regime with other economic and social institutions agenda for development. This we need the international coherence that unfortunately don't have this today. Okay? Second, it's very important that uh, we are already seeing a shift from global cooperation to one state to state. We have carbon clubs, you have global of competitions for clean technology supply chains and investments in different respects. Again, I insist that it's very important to have an innovative uh, climate governance, global ones, and how we go into the regional, these groups or the sects or these clubs of countries that are looking forward to address not only mitigation, but look, when you go into the situation, it's important also to observe adaptation and resilience. And this is very important to understand the demands of the global south, of the green global south. We need lead emergence of the leadership from the south also, not only from the north. It's very important to observe this if you want to move forward and moving on the both one, the short term perspectives move for, move on and long term perspectives move forward. We need to consider the short term perspective. This is very important to observe by two thousand twenty five. And the national interest of the G20 uh, uh, means absolutely is essential. This, this still, in my opinion, this is, these are, these interests are still disconnected. And we need that to, I think, that very important to have really policymakers, uh, uh, political leadership considering how we address, how we come together, not necessarily based on the consensus short term perspective, but in convergence process. My feeling, and my last two points, uh, we need to share uh, uh, more credibility uh, among our countries and also uh, in how will you allow carbon private finance to come. As mentioned before, I was able to, to, read, to, to, to read or to listen, is that we need really that the policymakers do their job. And it is very important to have robust rules and transparency. We, again, we need to avoid the wicked concepts like net zero. By net zero, everyone's agreed, but nobody knows the best way to achieve that. That's why you mentioned that you have been washing, women washing, etc. Et so, and my last point, I cannot forget the G20 to have in the next year three important emerging economies as the co-chair. You have Indonesia next year, you have India and Brazil. This is really a huge opportunity, in my opinion, how it could emerge for climate arrangements by 2025, bring the three countries together, and how, how we we'll connect sustainable development goals into the NDC's narrative and climate condition considering emerging economies. It's very important to have this robust umbrella, consider the ambition in the short term perspective of sustainable development goals, but you need to think beyond 2030. It is very important how for us, for example, in developing emerging economies, a clear example, how the end of the deforestation will dialogue with forest vision for on climate stability. Yes. Protect Amazon region in my country means to achieve 1.5 degree. This means climate stability. This is a powerful message from tropical uh, forests, and it's very important to join the, consider the, the chair of the G20 in the next few years to have this ambition, political ambition, to address yes. concrete solutions. Thank you very much. I do Thank apologize you. because I cannot hear very well, but I hope that I can see the outcomes in another opportunity, probably with a summary of the event. Thank you so much, Isabella, for putting together this very important point on, on the way we can envision leadership um, uh, to, to, to go ahead of this crisis. And, and as you pointed out, we indeed need to highlight the fact that it needs to be under the umbrella of the SDGs, which bring us a, a bigger picture of what is at stake here. Um, this, important, uh, this, this was important to highlight the, 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 the notion of, of leadership here because we, we, we need to guide the financial in industry into the right direction. As Frédéric has pointed out earlier on, the industry can put together some things at its own level, but it needs uh, political guidance. And 
that, that was the last chapter I wanted to develop here, as, as indeed we can't lose time because we, lead, we, we lack political guidance. And Frédéric, uh, therefore I'd like to refer to, the, to, the, to the, the book you've published with the, the book or report, I don't know how to, 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 to put it, but the, the, the so famous Green Swan that you published with the, the Bank for International Settlements. Um, that is indeed very well explaining how uh, non-linear this risk of climate uh, disruptions is and how radical uncertainty it puts uh, our economies at risk with. And in, in, in that context, it, it, this type of risk can't rely on uh, regulations like the previous one. I mean, we can't have a basal approach to such risks with modelizing that's something, something that is not modelizable. So uh, I'd like to know from the financial perspective and maybe bigger than this, you also touched upon the carbon price issue, what type of regulation we need, um, what type of policy guidance we need to, to turn the, the whole financial industry into the right direction. Well, you kept a good question for, uh, among many good questions, but the, the tough one uh, at the end. Um, I would say that, um, but it's almost um, um, a question of uh, for 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 uh, for philosophers. When you have um, a very complicated situation, not to say a radical uncertainty, um, can you still write a model? The answer is no. So, um, what is the um, new solution? Is to be very pragmatic. And to think that a very, you need to assess as many little risks that you're facing and try to address each of them locally and then to adapt uh, based on the feedback that you receive and you move on and you move on and you move on. Um, if, if, I, if I were to establish a parallel, um, if you, uh, a tough one, if you're Roosevelt, you're entering the war, um, do you write a model about how to win the war? No, you, you have some guys in Los Alamos and then you send some other guys on Omaha Beach and so on and so on. And uh, you hope that everything will work, but you keep on adapting based on what actually works. And I think it's uh, the same situation. So now if you translate that to the financial world, uh, to, to be back to reality, uh, we touch base about governance. Uh, we could touch base on the fact that corporates will face more and more shocks. We tend to forget, but uh, Fiat, that was uh, a 100 more years company, old year company, just disappeared. Why? Because they were not prepared. And Volkswagen lost 40% on the diesel gate and, on, and was in trouble. So then the question becomes, what kind of capital structure do we want in this chaotic world? where the financial structure that will absorb shocks and reduce the probability or the likelihood of billions. Who is working on that? Well, what, what is interesting in your answer is that indeed it's not a probably financial answer, it's a philosophical answer on, on the way to take action. And what I hear here is that start doing, stop yep. talking, yeah. essentially. And I, I'd like to pick up that point because I feel like we're, if, we, if we miss a strategy, if we miss an overarching approach, we risk what I would call Afghanization of climate uh, change fight. Meaning we, we fight battle after battle, but we don't win a war. Don't you, don't you feel we, we are at that risk? Yeah, maybe that's a natural process to enter the, the problem. I don't know. Uh, I think that there's a growing number of people realizing that we are not on the, on the right track of addressing the problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yes, I think we have to reflect on, then, on that and then <coughs> mobilize the brains. What is good with finance is that you have uh, millions of brains around the planet that can be innovative and so on. We need to, to channel them to invent the, the, the world of finance that fits with climate change. A conc another concrete example, we, we have extreme weather events that have been multiplied by four over the past 40 years. Yeah, and we have less and less insurance companies uh, covering the cost. Mm -hmm. And when there is an event, um, the, uh, the, uh, the insurance companies are paying only a fraction of that. 
um, that there's an insurance gap of 56% mm. in the US, 92% in Asia, 97% in Africa. So it means that when, again, you have an extreme weather event, human beings are losing their assets, their homes, yeah. their, and so on. Where are the financial instruments? That's, that's very interesting, uh, Frederick. I'm, I'm taking that away because one of the key recommendations that uh, the youth seven, the, 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 the youth chapter of the G7 put together as a recommendation in 2019 when addressing the inequality of our generation facing climate change was precisely to create at the state level an insurance against climate risk, which is, not a, uh, which is a market failure, I would say. Yeah, but so we can debate that at the state level. The problem is that the, um, the states are, are lost as well because they cannot absorb the shocks as well. So they try to, trans to transmit the risk. For example, Mexico issued a cat bond. So they try to, 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 to hedge themselves as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but w and then we say, okay, where is financial innovation? We have a cat bond market, but it's a small one, it's an obscure one, it's not working properly. We need something robust, you know, that can absorb again and transfer the risks. So when we talk about finance, the very first question is, can finance save the world? It can be part of the solution, but for that, it needs to, to face the challenge and to invent, to be innovative, to take risks and to bring something to society. It's innovation capabilities yeah. on a large scale. And uh, this innovation point is very important as we organize together this uh, debate with uh, EDEC Business School, which is investing a lot of research uh, about this issue. And I would like to thank them again for co-organizing this journey with the Open Diplomacy Institute and the step of the Rencontre du Développement Durable in Nice. Um, Bertrand, uh, I'd like to turn back to you one last time after closing this panel, as Frédéric pointed out, the fact that financial innovation in itself is very needed to uh, face the issue. As the managing partner for uh, Blue Like a Sustainable, uh, Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital uh, Fund, um, what type of financial inno uh, innovation would you need to um, cover those risks? Well, I, I think. Uh we shouldn't hide ourselves behind financial innovation. Finance people are very smart, so if they are provided with a clear goal, clear instructions, etc., they will find a way forward. And uh, coming back, I don't know whether it's philosophical or political, uh, but I, I like to remind everybody that finance is a tool, is a tool, is a tool, and like any tool, it must be controlled by the hand. And if the hand does not control the tool, the tool will go its way. So, uh, again, uh, the technicality, technicalities, new products, etc. And, and, and Frederick uh, uh, is an endless inventor of new new concepts, etc. And I pay tribute to to what is done. Uh, we will find some. My my point is really now we, we should not just rely and say yes, we will innovate and find something. We should really do more with what we have today. I mean, let's take an example. Everybody speaks about blended finance. Blended finance is an appropriate combination of public and private resources to finance exactly the type of assets we're discussing today. Uh, I've, I've participated, I did not count between one or two or 300 panels to discuss the benefits of blended finance. And we always uh, uh, compare the same notes, mention the same projects. So how do we bring this to scale? Uh, one of the big issues in the system, and then now I'm, I'm really targeting the, uh, the, the multilateral system, uh, is suffering from two diseases that have not been unfortunately hit uh, by COVID. The first one is uh, more of the same. So instead of reinventing themselves, they try to do more of the same thing uh, and don't take risk in, in trying new things. And sec the second thing is not invented here. We are in a world where people uh, do not tend to cooperate and, and, and try other people's idea. Everybody wants to have his own flag, his own commitments, his own thing. So if we're incapable, I mean, the, the positive thing with the COVID is that uh, once we were uh, against the wall, we've been able to, to, to find a vaccine very soon, to distribute the vaccine at least to part of the world. I mean, we still have a problem, unfortunately, with a big part of the world, but at least we've been capable of doing things that we thought we would be incapable to do. So are we hitting the climate wall? Yes or no? If we believe we're hitting the climate wall, we should be able to get there and innovate. I mean, there's a new vaccine, the ARM, etc., is very new. So let's uh, finance, uh, find its uh, ARM vaccine for, for climate. 
and let's make it clear to everybody this is a direction you like it you don't like it we all go in that direction and that's really what is at stake thank you so much bertrand as you said uh, this crisis has let us meet the wall the key difference with the climate crisis is that there, there won't be any walls there will be only waves on the ocean which are probably more vicious well we will put that um uh, as an end maybe not as poetic as the words um et je vais revenir en français pour euh, euh, terminer ce, ce panel en donnant la parole euh, à monsieur le ministre des comptes publics euh, délégué auprès du ministre de l'économie des finances et de la relance monsieur olivier dussopt qui va nous parler précisément de la façon dont le gouvernement français euh, pense la finance responsable au sens de la, des finances publiques merci monsieur le ministre vous avez la parole Mesdames et Messieurs, tout d'abord un grand merci de m'avoir proposé de conclure cette journée de travaux et d'échanges sur la finance responsable. La transition écologique, nous le savons tous, nécessite la mobilisation de tous les acteurs. Et il est crucial que les acteurs privés, les acteurs financiers en particulier, se mobilisent pleinement. La mobilisation du secteur privé est à mes yeux absolument essentielle pour atteindre tous les objectifs que nous nous sommes fixés. L'innovation d'abord, le levier majeur de réduction de nos émissions, viendra des entreprises, viendra des chercheurs, des jeunes entrepreneurs. Il faut aussi que des moyens financiers conséquents soient présents pour la soutenir. Le déploiement des innovations et des bonnes pratiques au sein de l'économie française et dans la vie de tous les jours nécessite un engagement de tous et des moyens financiers importants. Un autre enjeu que vous avez aussi évoqué aujourd'hui est de s'assurer que des moyens financiers massifs puissent être orientés dans la bonne direction, et ce vers le financement d'activités vertes. La finance responsable a là un rôle tout à fait majeur à jouer. En tant que ministre des Comptes publics, j'aimerais aussi vous parler également des initiatives du secteur public en matière de finances responsables et bien sûr plus particulièrement de celles de l'État. Le ministère des Comptes publics s'est engagé ces dernières années sur deux initiatives novatrices. Les obligations vertes d'abord. C'est un exemple, je crois, de très beaux partenariats entre les secteurs publics et privés. La France a contribué au développement du marché des obligations vertes en émettant en 2017 une première obligation souveraine verte, l'obligation assimilable du Trésor, verte, avec un montant initial de 7 milliards d'euros. La France a ainsi été le premier État à émettre une obligation verte pour une taille de référence, suivie depuis lors en zone euro par de nombreux pays européens comme l'Espagne, les Pays-Bas, l'Allemagne ou bien encore l'Italie. En mars 2021, une deuxième obligation souveraine verte pour un montant de 7 milliards d'euros à nouveau a été créée. Depuis, ces deux titres ont été réabondés, de telle sorte que leurs encours respectifs s'élèvent fin août à 29 milliards pour l'un et 9 milliards pour l'autre. Ces obligations vertes financent des dépenses favorables à l'environnement qui sont sélectionnées chaque année en répondant aux exigences les plus strictes et qui font l'objet d'une démarche d'exemplarité et de transparence par le biais d'évaluations indépendantes et publiques. Ainsi, l'OAT verte est un bel exemple de partenariat entre les secteurs publics et privés. C'est bénéfique à la fois pour l'État, qui peut faire levier sur ses dépenses vertes pour se financer, et pour la finance durable, en mettant à disposition un actif sans risque et liquide pour les investisseurs privés. Et ils sont de plus en plus nombreux à vouloir investir dans des actifs verts. La deuxième initiative que je souhaite évoquer avec vous est le budget vert. Issu de travaux lancés en lien avec l'OCDE lors du One Planet Summit de décembre 2017, le gouvernement souhaitait mettre en œuvre une budgétisation verte permettant d'évaluer les efforts budgétaires de l'État pour atteindre les objectifs nationaux, mais aussi les objectifs internationaux de la France. En 2020, la France a tenu son engagement. Et elle est ainsi devenue le premier pays à réaliser cet exercice innovant de cotation à l'échelle du budget de l'État. En quelques mots, le budget vert consiste à analyser l'incidence environnementale du budget de l'État au regard de six axes environnementaux la lutte contre le changement climatique, l'adaptation au changement climatique, la gestion de la ressource en eau, l'économie circulaire et la gestion des déchets, la lutte contre les pollutions et enfin la biodiversité. Ainsi sont analysés près de 500 milliards d'euros de crédits budgétaires annuels et près de 500 dépenses fiscales rattachées à chaque mission du budget, du budget de l'État. Un deuxi une deuxième édition du budget vert sera présentée dans les tout prochains jours à l'occasion des débats parlementaires sur la loi de finances pour 2022. Je, je ne peux pas vous dévoiler ces résultats dans le détail, car la primeur du rapport ira au Parlement. Mais d'ores et déjà, je peux vous dire que les dépenses vertes du budget augmentent à nouveau fortement en 2022. L'an dernier, dans le projet de loi de finances pour 2021, les dépenses en faveur de l'environnement avaient atteint près de 43 milliards d'euros. Et c'était par exemple le cas des dépenses pour les énergies renouvelables, à hauteur de 7 milliards, des dépenses pour les agences de l'eau, pour 2 milliards, une part de l'aide publique au développement, pour 2 milliards d'euros à nouveau, ou encore l'accompagnement de la transition énergétique avec ma prime Rénov', à hauteur d'un milliard d'euros, indépendamment des aides du plan de relance, ou les aides à l'acquisition de véhicules propres pour 500 millions d'euros, 
là aussi indépendamment des autres crédits euh, mobilisés dans le cadre du plan de relance. Il y avait aussi des dépenses fiscales, comme le taux réduit de TVA pour les travaux d'amélioration énergétique, qui représente 1,2 milliard, ou encore la défiscalisation dans le logement ancien, à hauteur de 300 millions d'euros, avec une logique de rénovation énergétique. Certaines de ces dépenses favorables peuvent aussi malheureusement avoir des effets indésirables par ailleurs. C'est le cas des, des dépenses ferroviaires, 4,7 milliards d'euros. Nous pouvons penser spontanément que c'est bon pour l'environnement. Mais il faut aussi tenir compte de la question des remblais ou de l'artificialisation des sols que peut entraîner tel ou tel programme, tel ou tel projet. On essaye de regarder toutes les dimensions environnementales et d'avoir la cotation la plus précise possible. Ces crédits globalement favorables à l'environnement, 43 milliards d'euros en 2021, étaient en augmentation d'environ 25% par rapport à 2020. C'est à souligner et nous allons continuer ce mouvement. Il faut aussi souligner que de l'ordre de 10 milliards d'euros de dépenses avaient des effets défavorables pour l'environnement et avaient été ainsi identifiés. Il s'agissait pour l'essentiel de dépenses fiscales à hauteur de plus de 7 milliards d'euros, surtout des exonérations ou des taux réduits sur les taxes sur les produits énergétiques pour un peu plus de 5 de ces 7 milliards d'euros. Sur les dépenses budgétaires, ce sont surtout les aides à la production d'énergie hors de la métropole avec 1,5 milliard de production d'énergie dans les zones non interconnectées ou des investissements en faveur du secteur aérien qui avaient été fléchés comme des dépenses pouvant avoir un effet défavorable. Ces dépenses répondent souvent à des préoccupations légitimes, et avec le budget vert, on fait un constat en toute transparence pour provoquer le débat et voir dans quelle mesure on peut les verdir et améliorer la situation. Au total, nous considérons que le budget vert constitue une amélioration de la lisibilité et de la transparence de l'information environnementale, et il permet donc d'informer le Parlement et la société civile sur les conséquences environnementales des dépenses de l'État et donc des actions de l'État. Avec ces deux exemples, à la fois les obligations vertes, mais aussi le budget vert dont nous faisons la promotion, je veux signifier toute l'importance que le gouvernement accorde à la transition écologique, au-delà des moyens très significatifs et en constante augmentation qui y sont consacrés depuis le début du quinquennat. Nous voulons donner un maximum de transparence sur les dépenses que nous mettons en œuvre, qu'elles soient vertes, qu'elles soient neutres ou qu'elles soient considérées comme brunes. Et en la matière, la France fait figure de précurseur au niveau international, ce dont je me félicite. Merci, Monsieur le ministre, pour cette euh, conclusion finale. Je voudrais remercier tous les panélistes qui, dans cette euh, table ronde de conclusion euh, organisée avec l'EDEC, euh, nous ont fait l'honneur de pouvoir euh, réfléchir à ces sujets en profondeur. Euh, avec moi en plateau, le seul qui a pu faire le déplacement, et j'en le remercie euh, d'autant plus chaleureusement, Frédéric Samama, directeur de l'investissement responsable d'Amundi, euh, en direct depuis l'étranger, euh, Isabella Texera, coprésidente de, du panel international sur les ressources du programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement, ancienne ministre brésilienne de l'environnement, qui euh, nous rejoignait depuis le Brésil, Moussanda Mumba depuis, euh, depuis l'Italie, où euh, elle est à la pré-COP euh, préparée par le gouvernement italien en tant que directrice générale du centre de Rome pour le développement durable, Bertrand Badré, ancien directeur général pour les finances de la Banque mondiale, directeur général du fonds Blue Lake and Orange Sustainable Capital qui était avec nous depuis Doha. Et j'excuse à nouveau le docteur Rodolfo Lassi, directeur de l'environnement à l'OCDE, ancien ministre mexicain de l'environnement qui euh, aurait dû être avec nous dans cette table ronde de conclusion de la journée co-organisée par l'Institut Open Diplomacy avec l'EDEC, investir la finance responsable, c'était la cinquième journée de ces rencontres du développement durable 2021. Merci à tous, vous êtes très nombreux à nous suivre chaque jour. La prochaine étape, c'est mercredi 6 octobre. Nous serons à Montpellier avec Montpellier Business School sur le thème « Fonder des sociétés inclusives ». Étudier la cohésion sociale de très près pour voir dans quelle mesure est-ce que précisément tous ces changements euh, pourront suivre pour les consommateurs, pour les citoyens, pour celles et ceux dont la vie va être impactée par tous ces dérèglements climatiques et cette transition écologique extrêmement exigeante. On en parle le 6 octobre après-demain. Rendez-vous à 9h, ici à la Maison de l'Europe, en direct avec nos amis de Montpellier. A très bientôt, merci à nos amis niçois, merci à tous pour votre fidélité, à très vite.